Raid and Zone Weekly with Steve Candray, Vince Kalati, Billy Hashner, and Jesse Mead. It is Raiders Zone Weekly. We're glad you joined us this week because uh, a lot of interesting stuff to talk about. Of course, I'm Jesse Mead. Billy Hassinger is here with me. Vince Kalati is also with me in studio. No Steve Candry on the job yet. Uh, maybe time to bust out some fines for Mr. Candry for not showing up to the job on time. Maybe he'll join us as we go along through, the, uh, through this week's episode. And uh, we'll start off on a pretty good note. Uh, talking about baseball. So really, this, this might not be a bad thing for Steve to miss. Um, guys, our first topic of the night... What is the best possible World Series matchup to you? Well, in, to me personally, I would like love to see a Detroit and Milwaukee matchup. But right now, the Rangers are playing very good baseball. Nelson Cruz hit his fifth home run of the ALCS today. He was tied the record for most home runs in ALCS. So it's just like the Rangers are playing lights out baseball right now. And with Verlander on the mound tonight, I think that the Rangers are going to adva- end up advancing to the World Series. Yeah, currently the uh, Tigers are leading seven four right now. I believe in the bottom of the eighth. But uh, honestly, the best World Series, the best matchup has to be the Cardinals versus the uh, Texas Rangers. You just got to go by star power alone. Albert Pujols coming in for a second World Series ring last year with the Cardinals is going to be a big headline. We all know Prince Fielder is on his last year too, but he's in Milwaukee. That does not draw nearly as much as Albert Pujols and how big of a name he is. And then when you look over the other side, you got Hamilton, you've got um, there Ian Kinsler, you've got those guys over there. The biggest name in Detroit is Verlander. So you really got to look at it, but everyone loves to follow Josh Hamilton and that group over there, high-powered offense, and really any matchup with St. Louis in is probably going to be a big, big watcher. Yeah, as much as I would, as intrigued, I should say, as I would be by a potential Detroit and uh, St. Louis matchup when you have the pitching against the hitting, when it comes to baseball, I love watching offense and baseball. So uh, to me, best matchup, you got to have St. Louis. you got to have Texas in there as well. Let's just have a slugfest and see who comes out on top. Uh, that would make the game exciting. That would probably draw in a lot more watchers, much larger uh, viewing audiences as well, uh, perhaps some bigger-name players. Uh, either way, I think when you look at the teams that are left in the uh, the championship series right now, either way, I think we're in for a good World Series no matter who reaches it. Yeah, we are. And, you know, one thing that really surprises me this year is with St. Louis, they don't have Adam Wainwright, who is always one of those guys who's right up there for the Cy Young each and every season. And this year had the Tommy John surgery at the beginning of the year, so he was the gone all season. I did not think that the, I thought they might make it into the playoffs, but I did not think that they'd be this close to actually making it to the World Series. Yeah, and the other the other factor you got to look into with these World Series is how big their markets are. Uh, we know the 1997 series, as sad as it makes me to talk about, it, the Indians and the Marlins was one of the lowest rated ones because of the market size. Even though Cleveland has a loyal fan base, you look at these two fan bases. Texas is slowly growing, and uh, St. Louis is one of the top two or three teams in in baseball. It'll be very. Uh, uh, I'm excited, you know, for baseball. I like watching baseball. For some reason, I've grown to be more of a baseball fan over time. I think we're going to get a good World Series this year. I hope we do. Uh, it's, it's it's about time we got a great World Series. I, I think it's something that happens when you get older because you can fall asleep and wake up and it'd be <laughs> like you're still in the middle of the game and you and it's like oh, it's still one nothing. I didn't miss much. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, speaking of something that uh, is going on, um, maybe not something that I'm going to grow more fond of over time. That is the explosion of Tim Tebow coverage. Got the uh, start, uh, is getting the start this weekend, I should say, for the Broncos. He rises yet again, and uh, is it time? Is it time for him to finally be the starter, or will this be a temporary thing? I just wish all the Tebow drama would end already. You know, you got the fans out there that are in support of him. And, yeah, Kyle Orton isn't playing the best football that we've seen Kyle Orton play, but it's not Orton that's losing the games. The defense is just playing atrocious this year. Like they did last year, they're toward the bottom of the league in a lot of the major categories that you need to be. So, despite the fact that Orton isn't winning the games, he's not losing the games. It's the defense that's not able to prevent opposing offenses to put points on the board. And about the best thing I've seen lately with Tim Tebow is Hulk Hogan tearing his jersey off on Sports Nation. That was pretty which made me laugh very hard. It was it was a video clip that I found online. I showed him last night. It was hilarious. But uh, Tim Tebow, you got to look at. He, he just draws in this. He's got this. Something about him that people absolutely love. I mean, they were proclaiming him as winning the national championship against Ohio State when it was Chris Leak who was the starting quarterback, who was the one, and they act like people forget that he that Tebow wasn't the starter in that game. He hardly played, and uh, you have that going in. So, but that being said, he does have that 
uh, ferocity, that will to win, I guess is the way to put it. We saw the speech that he gave after the when they won their second championship, the speech he gave after the loss. We saw him make that almost lead the Broncos back in that fourth quarter, and I think a lot of people are pointing to that as he could do things. This is really an experiment. If Elway does not like what he sees, Elway gets rid of him, they go to the Andrew Luck sweepstakes. To me, if you're the Broncos, <coughs> you're having a terrible season. Yeah, it's really the defense and not Orton, but what's the most visible change you can make? Put the guy in that your fan base loves, that's going to give you the most press, that's going to put some more uh, people in the seats, even though you're not having a great season. That is putting Tim Tebow in. I'm not sure whether or not he'll be any better or worse than Kyle Orton. You know, they, They've got a lot of problems in Denver that they're going to have to work through. But looking at it now, I think the biggest thing about the Tim Tebow nostalgia is that people are looking at his college career and thinking, if he could do that in the NFL, this guy's going to be great. So it's this hanging on to how great of a player he was in college. It just hasn't panned out for him yet in the NFL. The most interesting scenario, I think, was going to be if he starts, he does decent but not too well. Do they tank the season, get Andrew Luck, and then you've got another kid who's so popular uh, coming up. And then it's going to be a popularity battle. What's what's going? To, how bad is that going to drive the uh, the team? Yeah, that's the big question for the Broncos now. Lots of lots of questions. Uh, do you even draft a quarterback with everything that Denver needs? Because they've got uh, five, issues five, 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 everywhere. Five. The NBA is canceled the first two weeks of the season. The players and owners uh, then moved to Twitter to say that they are truly sorry about the cancellation. Are you buying this? No, because it's just. Both sides just saying that they are sorry to try and keep their fans somewhat happy because right now fans are angry that they're not going to see a season for at least the first two weeks. And if the players and owners act like they don't really care that the first two weeks of the season is canceled, they're going to lose the, their fan bases. So they're just trying to keep their fan bases right now. So at this point, I'm not really buying it until I actually see the players and see the owners displaying their their grief and it's actually legitimate instead of just something that's acted out. You know, I don't fully buy it. But I will say I think they feel a little sorrier than what the NFL did. Where There was never an apology to the fans of we're sorry we put you through all this. You're the ones who are the biggest losers of this whole thing. Nothing. It was just this side isn't saying this. This side isn't saying that. At least these guys are saying, hey, we're having a hard time with this. We're trying to get through. And at least it's a face apology at at, yeah. at the very best. And I'll, I'll give them a little credit of that. That being said, however, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm more along the lines with Billy. I don't see it as something that's really – they're not truly sorry yet. Once they start – if they miss the Christmas games, though, then they're going to be sorry because that's just going to be that, – that's going to be terrible for them. I've always had people ask me, why don't you have a favorite team in the NBA? Why don't you follow the NBA? And I tell them every time, I hate the NBA. I hate everything the NBA stands for. I hate the way that its player structure is run. I hate the way that its owners act. I hate the way its players act. The entire system needs to be blown up in the NBA. You have owners who are willing to pay guys who have never done anything. Multi-million dollar contracts for many, many years gets locked up. You're paying these guys that are never going to produce anything, and they're going to take that money, and they're going to not produce anything. They're not even going to give an effort to make your team better. They're just going to take the money and run. So you have the owners who are enabling the system. You have the players who are not getting after the other players for perpetuating this system. And it's resulted in an NBA that is completely bloated, that has way too much money being spent on players that should not ever be coming close to that kind of pay. And instead, now you've got two sides who are never going to reach an agreement for, before this season runs out. And this, the result is loss of jobs, loss of, uh, of basketball for the fans, and I don't think you're going to get any better of a system coming out of this lockout. I think it's going to be the same old, same old, uh, even after this season. Yeah, and you know, you talked about, Jesse, the way that this NBA is set up, with the, with the way that it is set up, each team is so far over the soft salary cap, or uh, most of them are, and all they have to do is once they reach so much millions over it, they just have to pay a luxury tax on it. And that's one of the issues that they're talking about is whether to set a hard cap or not. And I think that they per- personally think that they should set the hard cap because if they do that, it spreads the talent around and it'll, you'll have teams that will become more and more teams that will become more competitive. And we could see about 12 teams from each d- conference be more competitive toward the playoffs and we could actually see the East actually start having to rise up against the West because right now you got... The Mavericks, who were way over it, the Heat are so far over it. The Lakers are always at about ninety some million dollars, and the soft cap was at fifty some million. So just spread the talent a while, because after what LeBron James says last year, that the NBA is more or less a league built, which he's right. It's built for 
two or three dominant teams in each conference with one or two teams that are that are somewhat decent. The, the other thing you got to look at too is that these guys are um, they, there's even faction within the owners. The new owners want something different. The old owners want something <clears throat> there, and the possibility of contraction is huge here because you got a lot of small market teams that are not making the money because they're playing for guys that don't want to that yeah. don't really want to work. They're doing those. Those types of things. Also, to expand upon what's going on, this is affecting Billy and I as well. We graduate. If this is still in a lockout, that slices down our chances of a job. Both sport business majors are not going to be hiring anybody to try and do sales or public relations for them. It's they're going to be holding holding fort and waiting until that comes up. So it's going to affect kids who are coming out of college too that aren't going to play professional basketball but want to work in that profession. Well, think about uh, think about Cleveland. What is Cleveland going to have this winter? There's going to be nothing going on sports wise in, got, in hey, Cleveland. We got the Lake Erie Monsters, arena football, and that's about it. But in in reality, yeah. what how how far does uh how how far does a non NHL hockey team and an arena football team take you? This is a huge blow to some cities when you think about what they're going to be doing come winter. The NBA is just crazy to me. I mean, if you look at the money that Darko Milicic is still being paid, you know he was a bust. That's cool. You could, but now you should be paying him money that is worth, you know, a guy that scores four points a night and gets two rebounds. But instead, he gets paid huge chunks of cash to do nothing, and it's it, it blows my mind. I know I've seen some of those salaries that some of those players like Mochik makes, and it's just like, how? Because that's that's the system, and I I could rant on the NBA for days. <laughs> Whatever. Raiders uh, owner Al Davis unfortunately passed away last week. And the Raiders come away. They just win, baby. Uh, and uh, they're going to honor Al Davis this coming weekend. But when you look at the legacy, obviously kind of soured towards the end for the Raiders. But what what ultimately is the legacy of Al Davis? you got to give them props for coming in. That's everyone with heavy hearts. You saw Hugh Jackman at the end uh, with his sobbing into his assistant's shoulders and on the field with his head in his hands. I mean, he, he referred to Al Davis as coach. So, I mean, that's how much that team respected and actually respected and loved Al Davis. You know, like you said, over the years, Al Davis, he, um, you only knew him as crazy Al Davis. A lot of people thought he was kind of just a robot in there. No one thought he was going to die. When he did, it was kind of a surprise. But uh, he made some weird decisions. But when you look over his body of work, first, uh, uh, first and only woman CEO in the NFL – first head uh, black head coach he was all diversity and that I think is his biggest legacy he was the one to push in the AFL NFL merger he was the one to push those things he was the one that pushed the diversity issue and I think overall even with all the crazy stuff he did later he'll be remembered for completely owning the Ravers, Raiders every facet of it and uh, that the, the diversity that he brought to the NFL yeah I mean like Vin said he was part the AFL commissioner and really pushed for the merger between the AFL and the NFL way back in the day and, you know, he was a great owner. He did some great things for Oakland, got him to a number of Super Bowls, won three of them. And I know you and I were talking about this, Jesse, last Saturday. Was well, something that we, at least I will remember Al Davis for was toward the end of his crazy old senile years was just drafting fast players. Crazy in, draft in, picks. In, in, they got in the speed. draft. Darius Hayward Pitt, number seven overall. And then yeah. in the second round, Michael Mitchell, who yeah. Mel Kuyper has the famous quote of, I can't tell you anything about this guy. I didn't think he'd even be drafted. I don't yep. even have film of him. That guy ran a 4-2. Give him to me. <laughs> yeah, it, that's the way Al Davis operated in, toward the end of his years as, as the Oakland Raider owner. Is He just saw players that yeah. he liked. And Mitchell actually has turned now, out pretty good for him. Let me ask you a question. Is Ralph, Ralph Wilson, is he still the owner of the Bills? Yes. I can't yeah. that. Um, that would leave, I think, Ralph Wilson as the only guy who has owned a team for their entirety of their existence. L- Lamar Hunt. Is Lamar the, Hunt, the yes. The Hunt family is the only ones, too. Uh, and uh, you still have the, uh, yeah. And the Steelers. And Steelers, yeah. And the Mara family. Um, but still, you know, this is a guy who has owned that franchise for the entirety of its existence. The NFL does not exist the way it does today. If he doesn't, like you mentioned, push through the yeah. AFL-NFL merger, that was huge. That yeah. completely changed he, football. He wanted to be the commissioner. They gave it to Pete Rozelle. Well, so he was kind know, of angry about that. But you got to look at his, his renegade style really That would have been forward. interesting welcome, to uh, welcome imagine. Welcome Jerry Jones. Uh, he wouldn't have gotten there had Al Davis yeah. not been there first. And I tell you, I remember a linebacker for the Raiders. He was like, one day, Davis was standing alongside of practice and shouting at the players. And this guy, I forget his name. It was some funky last name. He was like, who is that guy who's screaming at us? And he, one of the other players looked at him and was like, that's the owner. And he's like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The first day in camp, saw Al Davis. Oh, man. Al Davis, though. What a, that, that's going to be a guy he will be talked yeah. about. I'm sure there will be very good NFL films to come on Al Davis. Definitely. Uh, TS, or excuse me, TCU changes their mind. 
not going to go to the Big East, which we said geographically is insane. Instead, they're going to make a they're going to pitch tent in the Big Twelve and hang out there. Is this a good move for the Big Twelve? Is it a big good move for TCU? Finally, a realignment that makes actually sense. makes sense geographically and talent wise because TCU they they're right there in Dallas or Fort Worth, right in that area. They get the talent of Texas with the scholarship reductions from a number of years back that Texas, Texas Tech, Texas A&M are missing out on. And, you know, TCU is a dominant football team. They'll probably end up winning the Mountain West this, this year despite the fact that they have two losses to Baylor and SMU. They're still a good football team. Patterson has done a great job with them. And they, their first year in the Big 12, they could legitimately be fighting for the Big 12 title next season. You know, I think this is a great move for the Big 12, but an absolutely strange move for TCU. Like you said, geographically, it's great. But you look at the, you look at the Big 12. Big 12 is a Texas or Oklahoma away from not ever existing ever again. So this is this is putting your hat, you know, putting all your mar- dice and one all your money into one basket. So there's the metaphor. Yeah, I was like, which one is it? <laughs> all your eggs in one basket. So yeah. uh, I really with the Big East, I know they're shifting a lot with the ACC and stuff. But if TCU had gone over there, they still had enough people to play. And again, the Big 12, every week it seems like someone's trying to get out. So you're looking at that. If Texas or Oklahoma, if one of those two team le- teams leave, it's done. Falling apart totally. And then where's TCU end up? They're going to end up back in Mountain West. They're going to end up somewhere on their own. That's going to be one of the teams that's going to be heavily affected. But I like this move in. You're, you're getting uh, with some other teams, Texas A&M leaving and stuff. You're going to bring in another Texas team, which is kind of nice. Nice balance. Yeah, they're trying to save things. They really are trying to plug the ship for the sinking uh, Big 12 right now. I don't know if they can do it. I don't know if TCU is enough to keep the conference together. I think, in reality, I think both Texas and Oklahoma have already made up their minds about what they're going to do. I just don't think we've learned what that is yet, ultimately. And really, either one of them would be fine doing whatever they wanted to do. They don't. The rest, It's the rest of the conference that is depending on them uh, for its continued existence, and especially when you think about what would happen to the other teams. Big East, I mean, Billy, we're talking about this earlier. Big East is talking about how it wants 16 football teams. And with, they've, already, they've already said that, you know, it's already been proven that uh, they don't care to sign non-geographic teams like a TCU. So I'm telling you, Hawaii going to be in the Big East at you, some point. <laughs> you can see where some of these teams might get swallowed up as well. Uh, Big 12 would be very sad for the day that the conference is no more, but it kind of looks like the writing is on the wall, even with the addition of TCU. Moving on to our cheers of the week, 49ers. We know we've highlighted every other formerly terrible team to be to start be playing good football, but it, it's about time we talked about the 49ers because they're the new bad team that's good this season. Yeah, you know you got to really look at what they did. They had a um, they they've had kind of a rough a beginning, a rough start. You got a new coach coming in, but luckily he's he's on he's been on that coast for a while, so he knows like the people, he knows the geographic area, he knows how to handle it. I think the best part thing that he did was he took them to Youngstown. Uh, you know, and Youngstown's not the best place to be, but that's where the ownership <laughs> is. And he took them as in, because they lost all that time before training camp. He wanted to get a camaraderie built together. And since then, it looks like this this team has really gelled together and become uh, become a, a, a your good bad your good bad team for the thing. And I really think it's that we get together, we get to really know each other on that bye week, and we're going to come back and we're going to play hard. You know, Michael Crabtree is starting to play pretty good and. I can't believe Alex Smith is finally actually starting to finally. look like a quarterback that they made him number one overall pick in 2005, which is ages ago. Late bloomer. Like. Late bloomer. <laughs> That's an understatement. But, you know, they are starting to look good. They've used a ton of first-round picks on that offense. Alex Smith. Then you got Vernon Davis. number of those offensive linemen, three of them. Crabtree. They've got the talent on offense. And then defense, they've got some talent as well. But they just have not been able to put it together. And like Vince said, they got Harbaugh who turned around the Stanford program tremendously and very quickly. And so maybe Harbaugh is the guy that was able to that would be able to turn around the Niners, and he's doing a pretty good job of it. Yeah, it kind of looks like he might actually be a rare coach that moves into the NFL and then is successful. I think the big difference, too, this year is that Frank Gore is healthy and not getting injured. He has a, He's had a pretty good year so far, and like you said, Alex Smith playing football like we've not seen Alex Smith play since college which is huge for the 49ers. Yeah, you got to look at also how many different offensive coordinators did he have? He had like six or seven of them. Every like, year he's been yeah. in the NFL, yeah. he's had a different it's, coordinator. It's like Jason Campbell with the Redskins. You knew Campbell has the potential to be at least a good quarterback, and and then but every year his, his quarterback, his offensive car- carousel kept going. So you got to look at that. Once he gets going, I still think Kaep- they're going to replace him with Kaepernick at some point. 
since they drafted him in the second round, unless Smith does something bizarrely amazing like throw for 25 touchdowns or at least they'll maybe sign him for another year before that. But a nice job doing the turnaround. If they can keep this going, they I don't – Maybe playoffs because of how bad the NFC West is. That's that's gonna be the thing that I was gonna they, say. That, they, that maybe they them. squeak in. Yeah, that uh, helps them a lot playing in the NFC West. Their biggest competition is Seattle. That's and, not a whole lot of competition. You know, why not? I mean, last year, last year the Rams went eight seven and nine after a one and fifteen year the year before, and they had a chance Correct. to make the play to win the division. Correct, and we saw Seattle pull off the greatest <laughs> upset of all time in the playoffs. Thanks to Marshawn Lynch. Yeah, thanks to Marshawn Lynch going insane and running for about a mile in one play. That was fantastic. Cheers of the week. You know, we've we've deliberately, at least I've deliberately, kept them off the schedule, off our Raiders on weekly schedule every uh, every week. But it was finally, it was just too much. Something had to be said. We have to jeer Ohio State because that was just embarrassing against Nebraska. Oh, it was. You know, I was texting my grandpa after the first couple of drives of the game when Ohio State was actually looking good. And they were. They were shutting down Martinez on defense. Their offense was looking good. They were running the ball. They were throwing the ball. Miller was looking pretty good. And then in the second half, when they're up by so many points, mm-hmm. Miller gets the ball just ripped out of his hands on the one possession. Then the next possession comes back, tweaks his ankle, and then Bowserman, he just looks like he should be a water boy. <laughs> Rough. The... The turning point was right there. They were driving down the field, and as he's going down, it was just a great play by their defensive guy. Just grabbed the ball and ripped it out. What Claret did to Miami's defensive back to get that ball back after the interception in the championship game. Same exact type of thing. They scored, and I remember going, it's done. We're, well, there's the turning point. There goes our momentum. But um, Miller gets hurt, and then basically they just ran the ball the entire yeah. time. Our defense got wore down because our offense could not stay on the field. And... It, that's exactly. It's like the same. It's the same thing we've seen. Uh, you you see teams that, that play against uh, Mount Union. They can't get their offense on, on the field for long enough. Their defense gets tired out. We run all over them, and it, that's what happened to us. Bowserman got so much hate for this game. Not that not that the hate wasn't correctly applied because he had a terrible game. What was he? One of ten, I think. Yeah, something uh, like in that. the field. Really bad game for Bowserman. But really, when you look at the defense. The number of points that they started in the second half, yeah, they were on the field for a long time, but you, at some point you've got to rise up and say, yeah. we're going to at least win this second half to keep this game because that could have been a huge subset, a huge turnaround for Ohio State. I guess the one upside is at least we know Braxton Miller can play some football. Yeah, you got to look at, too, the same thing that happened with Arkansas last year in the Sugar Bowl, that last play at the end. We finally stepped and made the play. Nobody could do that in, the, in that game, and... Uh, if the defense eventually the the mentality is going to break, we're going to end up just tanking the rest of the season. I don't want to see that as an Ohio State fan. You know, if it wasn't already for sure that Luke Fickle was going to be one and done as the head coach yeah. after the first two losses of the year, I think that loss to Nebraska just kind of sealed it up, especially being up that much. I mean, you hate to see it though because Fickle has a great mindset. He's a high State alumnus, but you got to feel for the guy. Yeah, I I feel bad for him. Completely. He was put into a horrible situation, and you can't blame Fickle for the situation that he was in based on what happened with. Trestle and the, all the players, but he's got thrown into a bad situation. He's going to suffer the consequences and for you it. Really, you really feel, you really get the feeling watching him in press conferences. This is a guy who is just kind of, you, you know, not lost control of the team, but lost control of the situation. There's yeah. no way he could have control it, of this him situation. Him and Bowserman were both thrown into the fire, and it was always like there was a shadow over Bowserman all the years he's been here, too. Not a good time to be an Ohio State fan in general. Hey, we need a five undivided soundbite. Let me get that up for us. Baseball time, and uh, if you're a baseball fan, it's not good that we have something else that's a bigger story than your MLB playoffs, but here we are talking about the Red Sox for five minutes. Terry Francona fired over allegations of players, uh, specifically pitchers, (coughs) drinking beer, playing video games, generally not caring on days that they have off. Theo Epstein now leaves the club. He's signing with the Cubs, hoping that he can turn around the Cubs, much like the Red Sox made their turnaround with him in. Is this a time where we're kind of looking at the Red Sox taking a major step backwards as a baseball club back to where we were used to seeing the Red Sox just a decade ago? I think so, because he's like Francona, like you said, Jesse, that he had players that were playing video games and drinking on the days that they weren't playing. The video games... I can understand that because, you know, especially, like, if it's a starting pitcher that just pitched the day before, they know that they're not going to pitch unless it's a dire emergency. So that is understandable. But drinking in the clubhouse before a game, that's just inexcusable. And if Frank Cono was not was aware of it and not doing anything to discipline him, that just goes to show that you're going to let guys get away with it, and then you just lose control of your team, you lose respect for the players, and 
it's one thing if the players don't like you, but if they don't respect you, then you cannot control them when things start going out of hit, getting out of hand. Even that, I mean, I don't even see that as the major issue here. The major issue, in my from everything I've been reading about this, a lot of uh, writers here on the ESPN blogs and stuff have been really slamming the management and the ownership of this team. Uh, you, you, uh, Francona, they when they're fine, they basically put a smear campaign against them. They addicted to painkillers, bad divorce, family ma- matters yeah, that's going the thing through. That's really why me. would you? Why would you do that? If he if he's leaving, you don't put a smear campaign against him. Basically, kill his any hopes of him getting stuff. And then your your young manager, your general manager, who you have a great connection with, now leaves too. Uh, I understand that he wants to leave because he's got one year left. He can't go maybe ten years. He doesn't want to be there forever, but at the same time, you've got all those issues going on, and it wasn't just the pitchers drinking. It's everybody in the in general. I think bought, the Red Sox just kind of expected they would win, and those people did not gel together. They they weren't friendly towards each other, and that's where it all fell apart. It's that's not Francona's fault. He still managed to pull that team through to almost get to that to the playoffs, and then you've yeah. got all those issues. The biggest one is the smear campaign. This is a team them. that was in the playoffs until the last day of the season yeah. when they blew it. And when you look at what Terry Francona did as manager of the Red Sox, this guy should have a statue built in Boston yeah. dedicated solely to him because he raised this team from the dead. And now you fired him. You've created this a giant smear campaign against him to try to make it look, look like this is entirely his fault. Some of it, yes, it has to be. Some blame always mm-hmm. will fall on the manager. But this looks entirely like a campaign to shift blame away from the front office Here's the, my question. I asked this to Billy earlier. You talked. We, they they keep talking about all these things that all these players did under Francona's watch. They fired Francona. Why are they not disciplining the players? Exactly. That's what I was about to say. You're looking at that. Players can always be traded if they're not gelling with the clubhouse. They're not gelling. Get rid of them. Francona. I'm. I'm sorry. Francona's been there since. I mean, he's the one who turned around that franchise. Him and Epstein together. Uh, Epstein provided the players. Francona made them the way they are. I I don't care how good a front office is. If you don't have a good manager, you're it's not going to work. And I, you can always trade players if they're not doing well. You eat their contract. Henry is rich. He can eat a bunch of contracts if he has to, and go and do that. That's uh, get rid of some of those players if they're doing that. I just wonder now with all the big name free agents they got, they got Euclid, Beckett, Ortiz, just the number of them. Who? How many of these guys are actually going to return if a lot of them liked? Francona, now yeah. that he's gone, how many of those guys will actually return, and then where will Boston be next season? Will they be a legitimate AF, AFC, <laughs> AL yeah. East contender, or will they just kind of dump it down into the bottom again? This is the third highest team, paid team in baseball. Uh, they have a lot of money floating around on that team, and that's not a good thing that you want to, to have. You're paying this team so much money to not be in a, a, a position of, of contention. It's, uh, you know, look, it's like the Cubs. I think they're in the top five, or they're near the top they're, five yeah, but uh, of teams uh, of salary, but they get nothing out of their players. You're in danger of that now with the Red Sox. They're twenty one million dollars under what the Red Sox paid for, though, too. So yeah. you've got you've got a guy. Uh, their owner's a little tighter management than uh, Epstein's used to. So we'll see what happens. Speaking of the Cubbies, now that they have Epstein, do we think that the Cubs can start to make a slow turnaround here in Chicago? Can he work the same magic that he worked in Boston? I think that he could. I just don't think it'll be as fast because Epstein was named the GM of the Red Sox in 2002 at age 28, which was the youngest GM in ba- Major League Baseball history. 2004, they won the World Series. So I don't think it'll be a three-year turnaround like the Red Sox had, but I think it could be about five or six years. So by 2016 or so, we could see the Cubs as a legitimate World Series contender because he knows what – he knows the talent to look for in players, and he does a good job assembling that team. And the Cubs do have some pretty good talent. They have a good hitter in Alfonso Soriano, although he's getting up in, there in age. They got uh, Giovanni Soto, who's a good young catcher, and who's just getting better and better. So I think that the Cubs do have a legitimate chance now to turn things around and possibly end the longest drought of over a, a century. They they have a lot of work to do. Uh Epstein came into the Red Sox or into the Red Sox. And it's not like they were in shambles like the Cubs are. Yeah, they were one game away from the World Series and before that. So he, they already had talent on that team that he that he used for that three year turnaround. I believe that's the real reason he got the right manager and went from there. Two thousand seven, I think, is more of his was more of his stuff than it was the previous manager. So he's really got a lot of work. You talk about Soriano; they probably are going to try and get rid of him because that's too much money. 
Carlos Zambrano, who's an extremely talented pitcher, but is liable to kill somebody. <laughs> um, you want to get rid of? You're probably going to get rid of him, or at least attempt to. You got to get rid of one of the two. Too much money in, involved in there. And then you got to you have to build up the minor league system. That's his specialty. Epstein's biggest specialty is building up that minor league system, building people up. The Cubs minor league system has basically nothing right now. So they got to get going, and he's got to find his right manager. If we don't think Quaid is the guy, give Sandberg a shot. He's been going through his stuff down the minor league level. A lot of people are clamoring. Same thing with Tebow. They're clamoring for Sandberg to be yeah. the Cubs manager. So something, you know, something's got to give it, with that. You could always just make it hilarious and, and hire Francona. That would be good. Yeah, a lot of people <laughs> are thinking that, but they say the, the yeah, tension's too much doubt, right doubt, now. Doubt it. But there's a, lo- there's a lot of stuff that has to be changed for the Cubs to succeed as a franchise. There is a, uh, a lot of things that have to be gutted to turn this team around. It, like we said, it's not that it's not the fact that they're hurting for money. They're definitely not hurting for money that they can pay to players. Their problem is is that they were just literally throwing money at the problem hoping that it would get better and it didn't. They got they then they got stuck with all these big contracts with all these problem players. I think that the biggest first step was getting rid of Zambrano. That yeah. was the biggest first step. You could see this team make a turnaround. It's very possible it's just hard to imagine the Cubbies doing anything else. But if anyone is going to be able to do it, it's going to be Theo Epstein. And really, you think about they can't go any lower than what they are right now. So True. they've only got up to go. And you know, it's like I said, they, it's not going to be an immediate turnaround. I think five, six years. Will they be. could they they could reach a Pittsburgh low. That's that's <laughs> yeah, a tiny could. bit lower. Although I guess not overall. I guess a century is as far as you can go. Uh, they haven't had a World Series game played in Chicago since the fifties. Moving on. What time is it? It is. Time for the talk about the Big East. <laughs> yeah, that was a nice segue. Uh, you were you were getting excited there for a minute. No, no, like, no, no, oh, no. Wait, you got a little bit, a little bit till hockey time. But here's the question of the evening for the Big East guys: Is it time in football for the Big East to lose its automatic qualifier status? Yes. <laughs> for yeah, well, out I, guess, I guess Billy's answer is yes. Um, I say not yet. I say it all depends on how things shake out. Got- well, it all depends on who they, who, however it shakes out. Remember, they're not afraid to cherry pick from any part of the country here. So you you've got to look at that. They bring more people in that are higher, more star power. Let's say, uh, and bring them in that way. That might be something if they can pluck some from the ACC or around there. That could be something to consider. I say you keep it going, but if they're still atrocious, yeah, get rid of them. Put the Mountain West in. They're probably better. I can guarantee you the Mountain West is better <laughs> than the Big East oh, yeah. right now in football. I say that yes, it is time for for a couple reasons. The last two Big East champs that they've had, Cincinnati and Connecticut, go into the Sugar Bowl and the Fiesta Bowl. And just get annihilated. Granted, they were playing Florida and Oklahoma, who have high-powered offenses, but they just are. Un- and we look at it over the years, from back when Utah defeated Pittsburgh in the Fiesta Bowl for the first BCS Buster in 2003 yeah. or 2004, maybe one of those years. Pittsburgh was eight and four, and since then you have not seen a legitimate number one Big East team. Last year it looked like Pitt was going to be the team. No, it was UConn at like. Eight and four or nine and three, they just do not have the teams that are able to stay consistent and stay competitive. West Virginia is a team that's up and down, and with Pitt and Syracuse now fleeing the Big East to the ACC, you're losing all of your teams there, and there's no one that really wants to go and join the Big East. It seems like. What's the storyline for the Big East every year in football? Pitt. Pitt is going to be the team. They got the talent. They're going to do it. What does Pitt do every year? They disappoint us. It's now like in basketball. Now that team is leaving your conference. That one team that people show up for is leaving your conference. Now, the big, who's the Big East have? They have USF. West Virginia. They've got West Virginia. That's not a whole lot to go on. That's not automatic qualifier status to me yeah. uh, as a conference. This is They were talking about they want to add all these teams they want to get to a huge conference you look at the teams they're talking about adding they're going to add they're going to try to add the service academies and they're going to try to add temple that's not enough that's yeah. not going to put you over the top you've, you've got to add you got to get some big names you got to try and pluck florida state or somebody from from the acc you got to pluck those guys over you got to pluck miami i mean you got to be hey look we got nobody you could steamroll people come on virginia <laughs> tech pluck them over something you got to get a big name in there to keep it and if if everything shakes out that way they might be able to steal one or two but i don't see it happening yeah. I, it, it's not not the not that the conference is in danger of dying but it really it, it has seemed like a, a a slow prolonged death of relevance uh, for the big east ever since they lost uh, miami Virginia Tech, how many years ago that Boston was? College. Boston College. How many years ago that was now? It has been a long, prolonged kind of fall from the top in football. It's been about five or six years, I think, since Miami came over to the ACC. So it, it, it is kind of sad to watch, but at the same time, you know, it is what it is. Let's find it. There's hockey time. It's time.
It's hockey time. Best part of my week, that sound effect, I swear. Uh, guys, the Blue Jackets are actually off to an 0-3-1 and start. It's actually the uh, good enough for worst in the NHL to start off the season. As uh, we expected a whole lot from the Blue Jackets this season, are you guys worried yet? Jesse, you cursed them. You went. You <laughs> put 82-0 and and you cursed them. I, I say 82 and 0 every year. Man, oh, okay. So, well, maybe that, I'm cursing them every year. Yeah, maybe. But I, I, I think it's a little bit. You might want to start worrying a little bit here. You got to get it picked up. Uh, I don't know how many years Nash has left on his contract. Do you know? Oh, they just resigned him. Okay. Nash well, there we're okay then. That, then I won't, <laughs> I'm not nearly as worried because if you, if I'd be more worried if Nash was uh, uh, sitting there going, well, I'm on a bad resign, team. I'm yeah, resign, leave. resign Nash. Uh, with the guarantee that they would then go out and sign better players, which no. they did this offseason with Carter, Zuzinski, and others. It just takes them. Then I'm going to have to hold off on the worry and say we've it's young in the season. We got to take some. It's going to just take some time. That's all. Yeah, this is exactly what happened last year in the NBA with the Heat. You know, Dwayne Wade goes down in the preseason with a hamstring injury. Oh no, the Heat season's done. They lose the first game of the year to Boston. Oh no, the Heat season is in turmoil. It's the first week of the season, for crying out loud. I mean, yeah, it's not the best start you want. They've only got one point because of that overtime loss to Colorado last night. But, you know, Nash is on pace to have a great season like he does every year. And I think once the other players that they just brought in this year, like you said, Jesse, once they get more familiar with the system and get a little bit more team chemistry built up, I think that they could legitimately be a five or six seed out of the Western Conference. I'm telling you what, that is the thing that is lacking with this team, and that is chemistry. I've watched every game, and you just look at it. This is a team that has so much talent, they don't know what to do. They get all the way up. They're rushing these teams, and the passes get sloppy. They lose possessions. They're actually out chances. They're getting more scoring chances than their opponents, almost 2-1 to one statistically so far this season. The one thing that gives me hope, I uh, went and looked this up last season, trying to find playoff teams from last year that had bad starts. Um, and I found actually almost half of the playoff teams had terrible starts to their season last year. Buffalo three nine and two, Vancouver two three and two, Anaheim four seven and one, Phoenix started four five and five. Uh, even the year uh, that Columbus made the playoffs, they only won four of their first twelve games. So slow starts, not a problem. Plenty of time to make that up. And every night that I've watched them on the ice, at some point or another, they have dominated the team they've played. The problem is they can't get it going consistently. And the second biggest problem, and the one that I think might not turn around, Steve Mason doesn't look good. Uh, no. I don't think that's a problem that can be fixed. That's the key. You need a good goalie. But, you know, in it's 82-game season. It's only four games in. you still got 78 games to go. There's time for a turnaround. Yet. Can they trade for Tim Thomas? <laughs> I doubt they have <laughs> anything that Boston would want for Tim Thomas. We'll 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 sell. We'll trade them rookie season, Steve Mason. <laughs> yeah, it's draft picks. Yeah, there you go. Uh, NFL has extended the games in England through the 2016 uh, season. Is this a good idea? I'm kind of indifferent about this, just because you know you got that game that goes across the pond over to England, and then you got t- player, you got the fans that want to watch that game, but. At least I've never been able to find the game on TV or anything because it's always different times and with the time differences. I think if you want to play games on Force Hill, just go up to Canada and play two or three games a year because it's right here. You know, the most interesting thing about this whole thing is they're considering adding two games over there. Yeah. And they're considering having a consistent team return each year. Now, I was reading, I read about this, and the possibility is it's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. They are, they, that they're going to start going over each year because they want to build a fan brand, a brand. And I think that's interesting. They had the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, uh, a team that's the uh, first team to go 0 and 14 ever in the NFL. A team whose uh, franchise has been up and down historically. You're going to use them as a fan base. I mean, they got cool colors, but uh, <laughs> I think yeah. I, maybe because they're a young uprising team, that might be something to consider. I think the I think the thing too with the Buccaneers is that any team that you want to be that team that returns on a year to year basis. You have to get that team to agree to do that. I don't think too many teams are going to be willing to, yeah. to do that. The Bucks might see it as a good opportunity for them to, to have an international fan base. I mean, the English fans show up. They, they, they usually sell out that one game, uh, which is good because I, I think one game is the key right now. I don't know if you want to spread yourself too thin here. The thing that the NFL also needs to start doing, which I don't think it will, it needs to start sending over good teams yeah. for this game. They're usually the games that they get. I think, well, who's it last year? Miami and New York. Yeah, something like I the Giants. Miami. Yeah, something. Some, I was thinking it was the Miami Rams. and Buffalo. 
Yeah, it was I, something it weird. Miami like, and some other bad team. I thought it was yeah, the Rams. It was, it was just two teams been. that were just like. But that's why? been the that's been the thing every year is that the NFL mm-hmm. has sent over teams that aren't good because they don't want to mess with the good teams' schedules. They, the good teams who have lots of clout, say the Patriots, you're never going to get the Patriots over there because the Patriots would never. Robert Kraft would say no every time emphatically. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just an interesting uh, conundrum that they're in with trying to stretch these games out. They got to really find follow the NBA's uh, the NBA's marketing plan for globalness. That's a pretty good plan. As much as the NBA stinks in, domestically, well, luckily for the NBA, it's also a more global game. I think True. for the NFL, if you want to have a second game, Canada is a good option. Uh, you know, it's a little dicey when you go into Mexico, but Mexico City uh, would, would would be would be a cool option for the NFL. Um, uh, Germ- there's a huge football following in Germany just because of all the American bases in Germany. I think that would be a good opportunity for the NFL to have one game a year there as well. They could have one in Hawaii besides the Pro Bowl. Yeah. It's far well, enough away. There you go. Just go to people Alaska. Like, people like Hawaii, right? Five undivided. Five undivided, guys. It's our last five undivided subject of the evening. And, uh, well... I'm pretty excited about it because it's hockey time. once again. <laughs> it's sad that Steve isn't here because he just missed bonus hockey time. Uh, rumors are swirling right now because the NHL is a little bit weird in how it's aligning with the Winnipeg Jets. Obviously, coming from Atlanta, the NFL didn't realign any conferences this season, so you have Atlanta playing in the Southeast, which doesn't make any sense at all. Um, they're looking to fix that though. Come the, uh, the come the off season, the biggest talk right now about how to fix such a situation would be to move Detroit to the southeast and just keep Winnipeg in the central where the Detroit currently resides. Winnipeg in the central, not too bad geographically. However, Detroit in the southeast obviously raises some problems. Is this the right solution for the NHL barring uh, a complete conference you know, and division uh, restructuring? If you want to have a competitive Southeast, yes, it is. Because you and I were talking about this yesterday, Jesse. If they were to take Columbus and throw them down there or Nashville, then you're just making the Southeast that much worse. They they got Carolina, Tampa Bay, Florida. Florida. There you go, Florida. And I forget who the other te- couple teams are. But if – obviously Winnipeg still yet. But if they take Detroit and put them down there, that adds some competition down there for Carolina. As we know that Carolina is normally – pretty good tampa bay is decent but if you were to throw columbus or nashville down there with the way that they are right now that would just be an, another co- division that these two teams those teams could not play in so right now putting detroit down there is a pretty good idea until unless they do decide to just realign everything well who's in the central of the east right now well when you look at you mean the west because no. that's where detroit is yeah i'm talking in the central of the east there is no central in the there's east. no central, there's in, no the central east. in the east oh okay i was gonna say well there's create a central in the east put detroit there move winnipeg over and kick one of those teams out that's closest to the southeastern corner and put them See, there the, that the, would prob- make the most the, sense. the problem with the southeast in the nhl if you look at it on the map it's everyone makes sense geographically. If geographically, Nashville is the closest team to the southeast to put in it. Yeah. The problem with Nashville is one, they're historically not a good team, and two, they're actually in the central time zone, which uh, uh, the southeast wouldn't want because then you're having weird puck drops for every other team that has to travel to Nashville. Yeah. So that wouldn't fly. So now it, it's pretty much down to Columbus or Detroit from the central because everyone else in the central doesn't really make sense when you look at Chicago and St. Louis. That wouldn't make sense. I would say because they're also central time. Why wouldn't you say? But I mean, if you're gonna do St. Louis, at least it's still a little closer than the other two, and that and it would match the NFL's crazy format as well. St. Louis is down in the west. I mean, they're kind of more central than anything. So, if anything, they're lower down. I would say they would be more comfortable traveling to there than they would to having Columbus or De- or Detroit going up. I would say I say just blow it up and redo the whole alignment. Real, realignment is is an enticing thing because you could potentially see Detroit uh, or even Columbus move to the east, something that a lot of people would applaud, although not a lot of uh, fans in the of eastern teams would applaud the, the Red Wings coming over to their conference. I'm sure uh, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia fans, Washington fans wouldn't be too excited, although you could have some great rivalries with uh with Detroit in the East, uh, you got. I mean, Detroit Pittsburgh every year after they faced off in the finals for two straight years. Yeah. That would be so interesting to see. Yeah, it would. And you know, the thing that I've always said that's unfortunate for Columbus is that you know, ending up in the West, you could have had a natural and very good rivalry between the Blue Jackets and the Penguins. But you know, it is what it is. Columbus obviously has no clout in how the NHL is going to do this because they've only made the playoffs once in eleven seasons. Well, eleven through this year. So uh, overall, I mean, if you want to make the Southeast good, then I guess you you stick Detroit in there and just let the Red Wings pound them every uh, 
every season until until Tampa Bay or someone else comes up. Uh, and that kind of leaves Central, though. If you think about, if you look at the Central, because Winnipeg is terrible right now. If you look at the Central, that leaves pretty much just Chicago. St. Louis is, used to be good, not so much anymore. Yeah, St. Louis Nashville is up, up and down. Columbus is up and down. That leaves really just Chicago yeah. to dominate the Central. Well, you also look at down there in Tampa Bay. You're kind of surprised because Tampa Bay is usually consistently good. Am I not? Am I right? Recently, yes. Okay. Historically, not so much. Okay. <laughs> All right. Just like any other Tampa Bay professional team. Yeah, there, there you <laughs> go. Uh, so a realignment in the NHL is actually really tricky business just because of the way uh, teams are, are laid out. Uh, really, when you look at the West, there's really only one way the West can be aligned. Um, and unfortunately for everyone, that means Colorado kind of has to be in there, even though they're not near anyone else in the West. Because uh, other than that, you know, you got the Kings, you've got the uh, Coyotes uh, out West, you've got the Vancouver Canucks. Uh, so you got a lot of teams, and Calgary yeah, Edmund- and, yeah, a lot of teams that make sense. And then you just got Colorado floating around out there in the middle of nowhere. Uh, Denver. It's just the fact that in the east you got so many of those big cities that it's are all the coast, along the east, along the coast, and then you get out to the west. It's just so spread out. Yeah, yeah well, it's the problem for every league, I guess. Really, that's why. You, that's why I've always liked the uh, the system, you know, that uh, the NFL and uh, MLB did. Even though it's still geographic in some ways, they have just a national league and an American league, so you're not yeah. ha- handcuffed by making it uh, purely geographic. Who that was really long. Let's go to uh, Raiders Zone, Mageddon. Even though I'm not really sure why I want to talk about it this week. Because I lost again. But here's the sound bite. Also a good one. Billy and Vince. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Glad you're both here to talk about it. Steve is not here to wallow in misery with me. As uh, you guys were the big winners this week. I, of course, fell to one and four. And I'm just completely sad because I lost by three points to Vince. I feel like every time I lose to Vince, it's in some cheap way. It's not really in a cheap way, though. I no, mean, it's this, cheap, sir. How is it cheap? This it's cheap. It's cheap because you won. <laughs> <laughs> I was. How about so? Yeah. Well, maybe it was cheap this week because Michael Vick threw four interceptions, still got me twenty-one points. Yeah. Although I was still angry at him until I found out that Matt Schaub only got me twenty. That was like, okay, I'll forgive you this week, Michael Vick. Michael Vick continues to make me alternately angry and happy. So he's like my he he's my uh, um, up and down guy for the week. I don't I don't know. I don't quite understand him. Uh, but I'm glad I won. I don't understand him, but I'll keep starting him. Yes. <laughs> you know, I just found it funny because, you know, last week Steve was able to get a victory without checking his team. This week he had two guys on a bye. One was Ray Rice in the Baltimore in Baltimore's defense. So that just made it a lot, whole lot easier for me. But Calvin Johnson went off. Drew Brees I believe went we off. have an update from the MIA Steve. Steve Candre, somewhere where we don't know in an undisclosed, undisclosed location, location. Says, says for me to tell Jesse, it doesn't matter that I lost. Wins are bonus points for him. He right. probably didn't even look up his, his group this week. No, that, he didn't. He had two guys on a bye that, this that week. That loss is just gravy for him. He had it, you know, in the back the entire way. Uh, but, you know. The only thing that matters to me right now is I'm four and one. I'm in first place. Yeah, Billy's kind of uh, Billy's kind of riding us here. This is yeah. this isn't too good. Yeah, he's well, running truck his, all over us. Well, his only loss is to me, and he's facing me next week. So maybe and we can re- write him on the path. And vengeance, again. I shall get. We'll see. We'll see. It's not you know it, it's it's very hard. It, this is a big blow to my fantasy football intellect to be yeah. one and four. I don't think I've actually ever had a losing season in any fantasy league yeah, I've ever been a part of. Especially, I, Jesse, after I did an interview with you for my Dynamo article on how to fantasy Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, uh, you can use my other teams as examples. <laughs> but, yeah, Raiders on again. I don't uh, know what it is. My, I cannot get off no, the schneid. My other two leagues, I can't. Get, the one league I've been in for three years, I'm 1-4, and four, and I've, I've started off 6-0 no the last three years on it. And I don't know what's going on. You yeah. know what's really funny to me, Jesse, is the other league that you and I are in together where you were saying that it was shenanigans, I had the number one pick. I'm one and four in that league. I'm doing horrible in that. In yeah, that. yeah, that uh, that didn't work out too well for you, did it? No, but you know what? I don't care about that league anymore. Raiders Omegans, where's that? I get to yeah, ride you guys I every guess. week. You know what? You know what I'm sad about? Steve isn't here for the unveiling of our new soundbite and the new name for our D3 segment. I'm very disappointed, Steve. Here it is. <laughs> you know you like it. <laughs> it's D3 for three here on uh, Raiders Zone Weekly. Very classy. It's the segment where we talk about D3 football for three minutes. And, uh, guys, we talked last week about who the real number two team in the Ohio Athletic Conference is. Are we any closer this week to knowing who it is than we were last week now that we've had a little bit of shuffling around? Heidelberg jumps up to the number two spot. I think it is becoming more clear who the number two team is. You know, we talked about Muskegon having a tremendous defense this year, not allowing very many points, getting a ton of sacks through the first number of games of the year. Heidelberg coming out. Even though they only put up 17 points against it, that still goes to show that their defense has stepped it up this year. Their offense is still able to put up points against a very tough 
defense than must, that Muskingum had. So Heidelberg could legitimately be the number two team this year. And, you know, we traveled with the Tiffin on Saturday to take on Heidelberg. So a lot of good implications for us this season. You know, I'm going to disagree with you. I don't think there's any clear number two yet. Uh, when uh, If we go up and we're going to play against Heidelberg, who's uh, they're a great offensive team, but at the same time, again, their defense is just starting to get through, and we know Heidelberg can be up and down with all that stuff going on. Uh, Ohio Northern, if, if anything, we'll, I will not be surprised if we see Ohio Northern come out on at second again the, the rest of this year. This but Everyone's just been so up and down. I uh, I think that it's gonna, just going to end up shaking out the way that everyone thought it would, and we're we're going to be on top. Ohio Northern will be second. Baldwin Wall is third, and so on. And uh, unless unless Heidelberg can keep whatever defense they figured out going, I, I don't see them. Uh, I, I, just, I just don't have a good feeling yeah. about them. I think the thing for Heidelberg in that game, they shut down a Muskingum offense. Muskingum wasn't blowing people away with their offense. It was their defense that was doing wonders. And again, their defense played very well against the Heidelberg team that's been lighting everyone up. They held the Berg to 17 points. I think that says a lot about Muskingum's defense. Unfortunately, looking at the OAC now, we're kind of thrown for a loop as a who can be number two, especially if, say, this game on Saturday isn't that competitive, if Mount Union is able to uh, come away and kind of take it to Heidelberg. I don't know what that means for the OAC. You know, uh, Baldwin Walls has still got the talent to do it. You look at team, you look at some other teams uh, kind of floating around the league. They definitely uh, could be the number two, but now it's kind of looking less and less like we're going to be able to sneak uh, a second OAC team into the Division Three playoffs. At least this year, yeah, it definitely looks that way because the High Northern with their two losses coming consecutively, Muskingum, they'll have at least two losses on the year. And Baldwin Walls, they're just they're they're floating up and down, like you said, Jesse. Especially after that loss of Capital a few weeks ago. So, no clear number two, but I definitely think that Heidelberg is making a statement, and that's not just the biases I'm talking there. Totally not, totally not the not totally not the Tiffin bias. Final picks, uh, guys. It's it is pick time. Yeah, it is pick time. Number eleven, Michigan taking on number twenty three, Michigan State. This one is in Michigan State. I'll take Michigan State. I think that they were able to figure out Denard Robinson last year, and I think that they know how to shut him down, so I think that the Spartans come out on top. Michigan State has won the last three games against Michigan. I'm going to pick Michigan State as well. Wow. Well, I guess I'm going to be the only one picking Big Blue here because, uh, yeah, I'll go with the Wolverines. Blech. Been pretty impressed with them. You I know, I, I'm, I'm kind of sad that... I'm not going to refer to that. I'm just going to refer to them as that other team. Kind of sad that this know. does not spell good things for Ohio State down the line. Number Steve, 20, wait, Baylor. Steve's, Steve's pick is Michigan State. Denard is overrated. <laughs> oh, there you go. Oh, we're going to have Steve live via... I, I guess we're going to have Steve via text message here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Vince, for that. Number 20, Baylor at number 21, Texas A&M. Give me Baylor. Robert Griffin is playing tremendous, and you know, he, even though they lost last week and he threw his first interception of the year, he's still playing tremendous football. I, I lost my paper because my computer died, so I have no idea who who is picking. I'm going to go with Baylor uh, over A and M, and it's going to be a. Um, uh, I think uh, Robert Griffin got to go. Got to go with the wow factor with Baylor. Uh, Steve picks Baylor as well. Wow. Oh, you know, we should have just had Steve live via text the entire I show. Know. Uh, it's almost like he's here. Almost. It's crazy. With, without the biting sarcasm. <laughs> number six, Oklahoma State at number 22, Texas. Oklahoma State. You know, everyone, yeah, Vince has a heart attack. I had to pick there Texas last week against Oklahoma. There it but, is. You know, I'm Texas ho- man <laughs> picking against the Longhorns. Don't get me wrong, though. I hope Texas can pull it out, but, you know, they had trouble against Oklahoma offense, and it's a very similar Oklahoma State offense. I, I think it's going to be Oklahoma State as well. Texas is just too young to go with it. Um, and uh, just too young, so I'm going to go with Texas. Yeah. Or, sorry, Oklahoma State. My bad. <laughs> Texas uh, is too young. Oklahoma State is my pick. Let's let's all have a moment of silence for Billy's Texas Longhorns, as this will be their final week in the rankings as te- S- Oklahoma State. Steve Kandre, Oklahoma State. <laughs> no no doubt? No, no doubt. doubt. He just said no. OK State. OK, yeah. And he okay also said State. you were funny. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. Wow, you can almost sense the, sense the sarcasm there. Yeah, yeah. Number 18, Arizona State taking on number 9, Oregon, in Eugene. Give me Arizona State in this game. I think that with LaMichael James out for this game, they don't have the dominant running game. And I just think that Arizona State is definitely going in the right directions. Love their unis. Yeah, that's going to pose a big problem with uh, with LaMichael James out, but I'm still going to pick Oregon in this battle. It's at home. The Oregon uh, crowd is always tough. Same thing with the Seattle crowd. So I'm going to go with uh, Oregon in this matchup. I tell you what, when you look at the West Coast teams, a lot of exciting football to still be played in the, the Pac-12. Uh, as far as this game goes, no LaMichael James. 
do agree with Billy. I like what Arizona State's doing. I'm going to go with the Sun Devils, too. Steve yeah, agrees with both of you. He's going with Arizona State. Look at us. We just all think alike. I can't wait for us all to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> NFL, Houston taking on Baltimore in Baltimore. As much as I would love to pick Houston, they don't have Andre Johnson, so Baltimore, I think, is going to be able to shut down the high-powered Houston offense. They don't even know Matt Schaub is going to be ready for this game. Pick, Give me Baltimore. Yeah, no Andre Johnson, no Matt Schaub, no Houston Texans. Uh, Baltimore will win this. And one. no Mario Williams anymore. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I know Mario season. Williams. Oh. Yeah, pretty much, can anyone name anyone that still plays for the Texans D'Amico at this point? Ryan? There you go. Steve Cantry with, with the letter B. I'm going to assume it's Baltimore. Yeah, seeing as there are no Bs in Houston nope. or Texans. I, yeah, that's a safe <laughs> assumption. San Francisco taking on Detroit. This is the game of the week, guys. 49ers and the Lions. Give me Detroit. They're playing great football. And Dominic and Sue, even though he's going up against three first-round picks on that offensive line for San Francisco, he tears it up. Is it where is it? Is that San Francisco Detroit. or is that Detroit? Give me Detroit. That crowd was fantastic in that last game. I think they ride that momentum, carry it, go with Detroit. Oh yeah, I want the Lions to stay undefeated. You gotta stay undefeated until you get that Packers I game. Want, yes, I that would be see amazing. That, that yeah. would be good football. The best, last two undefeated teams. That'll be the best. That'll be the best Thanksgiving game we've had in the longest time. If it can happen, of course. If anyone is going to crush our dreams, it's going to be the Detroit Lions. So uh, <laughs> don't don't hold too closely to that hope. Bonus round, final thing of the night, guys. This is actually Billy's idea. I'll give him kudos for it. Pick an upset of the week for this week. I'll let oh, you wow. take this one, Vince. Huh? Well, that's a tricky one. <laughs> huh? You know who's playing the Patriots this week? Really? You're just going to play this game? <laughs> who's <laughs> playing the Patriots? Whoever's playing the Patriots, who's playing pick the them Patriots? For the upset? I'm not sure who's Are playing they the Patriots on a buy? this week. Couldn't tell you. I'm not no, Patriots they fan. do have a game this week, I, I think. I you could just say the Vikings upsetting the Bears would be an upset. You know, <laughs> that, that might be an upset. I'm going to go. No, I'm going to go with the Miami. Terrible. I'm going to go with the Miami Dolphins upsetting the Jets. They're 0 and 4, and on Monday night, I say they step up and they win. <laughs> there you go. It's not much of an upset since they have like two wins, but still, that's going to be an upset. Hey, the third team's a charm for Vince as he went through a few different teams there. I'm going back to college football for my upset of the week. Number eight, Clemson at Maryland. I think that the Terps are able to knock off Clemson. You know, I'm glad we all resisted the temptation to pick Ohio State over Illinois because that just would have been very sad. Yeah, I think. I don't see it happening. It, it, and this might not seem like a. Uh, upset that I picked record wise but mentally to me this this would be a big upset and that is Carolina beating Atlanta in the NFL yeah um, I think it kind of signals a very fast and unexpected <laughs> changing of the guard uh, in the NFC uh, South yeah, no response from Steve for these last two picks I'm gonna assume he's confused like he was last week <laughs> yeah, you know what Steve we, we don't need your picks you obviously don't respect us enough to show up so you know <laughs> whatever he, reason. don't worry Steve, Steve, Steve will receive something a, came up I'm sure Steve has a good reason for it Steve I'm will receive a hefty it. fine uh, for his actions this and maybe week. a two show suspension <laughs> two show suspension Ooh, we'll see will Steve return next week who knows turn it tune in next Thursday to find out the fate of one Steve Kendrick oh, wait 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 we have an update oh no never mind it's it's just an angry text. We're not gonna we're not gonna say. <laughs> it. Either way, we do have high school football tomorrow night. We will be heading to West Branch. It'll be West Branch against Louisville. Should be some good football uh, in the Northeastern Buckeye Conference Saturday. Got Mount Union taking on Heidelberg. That game in Tiffin, Ohio. We'll find out just how good Heidelberg's offense is uh, coming off a season where they've lost quite a few uh, good players. So a good weekend of football lies ahead of us. We hope you'll join us for both games. And again, don't forget to tune in the Raiders Zone Weekly next Thursday, 8 o'clock, same time as always. Look for this to be popped up on YouTube in just a little bit. Thank you for listening to Raiders Zone Weekly, and thank you for listening to the Raider vo- the radio, radio voice. voice, not the Raider Voice, radio voice of Mount Union. This is WRMU 91.1.